talk about some limiting factors. The idea is that of the biotic and abiotic characteristics of an organism's environment, some of them will be limiting. In other words, they will put a cap on the population size and on population growth. So a limiting factor is anything uh, that puts a limit or puts an end on how much an organism can tolerate. And our goal is to explain how this influences organism distribution and organism range. So by distribution and range, we're really talking about where can they actually live. Now in that list of examples, you'll see that we had all of them on our list of biotic and abiotic factors yesterday. So you might want to just make a note to yourself, hey, I already wrote these down. But some examples of limiting factors are listed here. Water availability, temperature, food availability, disease, predators. These are all things that if they are not present in the right amount, would reduce the number of organisms that could live and where they could live. And so if we increase these factors, we'll end up restricting the range and distribution of populations. And the main idea that I want to illustrate to you is that organisms only exist within what we call a range of tolerance to their resources. So I have two graphs. One of them is a specific example, and one of them is a very general description of what a graph might look like, so that I could pick any factor, make a graph out of it, and you would know what the graph represents by looking at the shape of it. So on the left here, I have a graph, and we'll just make it a little bit bigger. On the left, there is a graph that is really specific. It is showing growth rate as compared to temperature for three different type a fish. Rainbow trout, yellow perch, largemouth bass. And what this is trying to illustrate is that each fish has a different temperature where their growth rate is at its maximum. So I'm focusing on this point here, the maximum. The point where their growth is maximum would obviously uh, indicate to me that they like that temperature the best. That is the most productive temperature for them. Now in the picture that's on the right, this is referred to as the optimum tolerance range. So where that maximum point is, and then a little bit of the graph to the left and to the right of it. So notice we're saying that kind of this whole section here, where it's at its maximum, uh, and then a little bit to either side of it, would represent optimum tolerance. This means it's the best for them. Now once it starts getting really low, like down here and down here, we enter the stress zone. That means that the organism can survive, but there's not very many of them, or they're not growing very much. In other words, something in their environment is making it difficult for them to survive. The last range that we would want to look at on a graph is called the zone of intolerance. 
And that would be, for this particular organism, the part of the graph where the line doesn't even exist. We're saying that at temperatures higher than 40 or less than 10, largemouth bass just aren't there at all. They're not, they're not just stressed out by the temperature. Maybe it makes it difficult for them to grow. They, in fact, do not tolerate it at all. So the key here are the words absent, few, and many. So any type of graph I would show you about organism growth or number would have this characteristic shape so that you could deduce where their optimum tolerance range was, what their stress zone was, and what their zone of intolerance is. I will use these vocabulary words, intolerance, stress, and optimum, uh, to ask you to identify you know, maybe values off of a graph. So this isn't something that you have to memorize. Like I don't want you to memorize which temperature is the optimum for a yellow perch. That's just an illustrative example to show you what an actual graph with actual values would look like uh, for the very general example that's on the right. Now, would anybody like to ask any questions about these two graph examples? Uh, so then I'll just remind you that there are a few biotic factors that are limiting. For example, competition, predators, and parasites. Uh, now, we mentioned most of these in our class yesterday, but I just want to make sure that you have an example for each of them. Competition could be because there are many types or many varieties of the same species, and they all require the same resources. So usually, that is what competition is for. You want that food, I want that food, we're going to fight over it, one of us is going to win, one of us is going to lose. Predators, let's remind ourselves, are things like third order consumers. Now they could be second order consumers too, but usually when we think of predators, we think of things that are third or higher on their food chain. Uh, and then we did mention parasites the other day. I just wanted to make sure you had a few examples of what they are. Uh, in my example here, there is a leech, a flea, a tick, and a louse. Uh, these are all organisms that require a host. They need uh, to take energy from some other organism in order for them to survive. Now, there are also abiotic factors that would be part of this discussion. The biggest abiotic factor would be the idea of climate. Now, climate is where we're talking about average weather conditions. In other words, temperature and rainfall, temperature and precipitation. And climate is the thing that causes a particular biome or a particular ecosystem to exist. So on the left, you have a nice little picture that illustrates different types of biomes that exist. And again, this is not my main objective for you to memorize this. That's not the goal of this unit. What I do want you to recognize is that on this graph, the bottom is precipitation. There's lots, there's little. On this graph on the y-axis is temperature. Uh, this is hot, this is cold. And what we're trying to illustrate is that these two conditions determine which type of ecosystem is going to exist there. So weather conditions are the big contributing factor to what type of ecosystem there is. An ecosystem will determine what type of organism can live there. Now, the map that's on the right is trying to illustrate to you how these ecosystems would be laid out over the planet. 
So for example, you might all be aware that in the northern parts, that is where you find tundra. You might be aware that near the equator, in these gray spots, is where you find a desert. Uh, and so it's really important to recognize that precipitation and temperature, which are largely determined by your latitude and whether or not you are close to an ocean, will determine what type of ecosystem there is. So it's not the details of a specific ecosystem, but the principle that weather determines ecosystems, and that determines which organisms can live there. Now, there are other abiotic factors besides the big ones, temperature and precipitation. Things like soil type, the moisture or humidity that is available, and not just temperature, but temperature range. That means changes. So we would get at the idea of there being seasons. For example, we have a huge temperature range here. It can get very, very hot in the summer, but ridiculously cold in the winter. There are some types of organisms that do not do well in this. For example, there are some people on my street. I don't know why they insist on doing this. They have planted and let die and planted and let die cedar trees like about 15 times. Uh, cedars don't really do good in our atmosphere. They don't do well with the constant hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Uh, and most people who have them, if you don't wrap them up in the winter, they are going to die. They will turn brown. And I've seen a number of people attempt to have them, and they just won't grow. Whereas at my parents' house in Edmonton, where it honestly is colder, but it stays cold. It's constant all, the, all year long. My parents have these two huge cedars in their front yard that my dad has to cut every year because they're so big that they're touching the roof of the house. Uh, and so temperature range, temperature changes, uh, can have a huge effect on what kind of organism can survive. Another good example uh, that's based on an abiotic factor, uh, because it comes from actual southwestern Alberta, which is us. We live there. Uh, the idea is that the river flows and it floods. And that's good. The trees like that. The trees require periodic flooding of the banks. Otherwise, there wouldn't be enough water available to them. So some trees like flooding. Other organisms would not like flooding. So all of these factors would be specific to an individual organism and not to all organisms in general. Uh, would anybody like to ask uh, any questions about climate or about these abiotic factors? That picture is from near Fort McLeod, which is just like a little bit south of us. And that's where this example of cottonwood trees is taken from. So we know that things can be biotic or abiotic. We know that it can limit the growth of organisms. And a couple of words that we have to be able to define are habitat and range. Because we're saying that these factors will affect where organisms can survive and how many of them can survive, we have to describe the difference between these two words. Habitat is a place with specific abiotic and biotic conditions. If you wanted to, you could think about ecosystem, and we could probably interchange those words in this sense. Range is a geographical area, like on a map. And so they're not saying the same thing. And so to help illustrate this difference, I have an example regarding snow leopards. For a snow leopard, if I wanted to talk about where they live geographically, I would talk about on a map with the names of geographic places where it lives. So you'll see this spot that's outlined in green, 
All of that is the range of the snow leopard. Because I'm not telling you anything realistically about the conditions that they're living in. I'm just telling you where, where they're living. The second part is talking about their habitat. Because in the second part, I explain an abiotic condition, altitude. In the summertime, they exist at high altitudes. But in the wintertime, they don't. So the difference is, in the first one, I said where on a map I would find them. But in the second one, I didn't say anything about a map. I just said something about a characteristic of their environment. That's the difference between habitat and range. Now, both of these things could be affected by biotic and abiotic factors. But usually, the thing that is the most affected is their range because the biotic and abiotic factors of their range could change, then it's very affected by limiting factors. Organism specific habitat isn't a description of a particular place, it's a description of characteristics. Since if I change those characteristics, I'm not talking about the same habitat anymore, usually the thing that is affected by a limiting factor is the range of an organism. Uh, would anyone like to ask any questions about habitat or range here? So then the next thing uh, I want to talk about is an organism's niche. Now we've used this word before when we talked about trophic levels. What we're talking about here is the role of an organism. So their niche or their role or their trophic level, what they do in their ecosystem, has a lot to do with habitat and range. Species can share habitat and range if their niche or their role is different. So in this big picture, I have a few examples. Here is a bird, and here is another bird. They are both birds. They live in the same habitat. So they need the same set of conditions the same set of biotic and abiotic conditions, but there is a big difference. This one hunts during the day, and this one hunts at night. And so they have a different role. They are not searching for food at the same time. The other thing that's different is that the actual food that they are eating is not identical. It's similar. Uh, here it says that they are looking for their food in open water. Uh, and for the heron, it is looking for food in shallow water. So they're both birds that live near the water. One of them hunts during the day, one hunts at night. One looks for food in open water, one looks for food in shallow water. So. Even though they are in the same physical place, they do not, they're not negatively affecting each other. Now over here, we have a human. Humans share habitats with a ton of things. And that is because we have a very general niche. We do a lot of things. Uh, and so because we can be a different part of the food chain depending on which organism we're relating to, we can share habitats with lots of other species. Now, this organism here, which is a sea cow, I love the name of that, a sea cow, uh, this organism has a very, very, very specialized niche. And what we mean to say is, uh, it requires some pretty specific conditions. Uh, it is not easy for this organism to adapt. Uh, that means that it is very hard 
for this organism to share. It's kind of like a two-year-old who can't share with anybody, but this organism has such a specific set of conditions uh, for it to be able to reproduce and for what it eats uh, that it is really hard for this organism to share a habitat with another organism because it cannot adapt. It can't do something else. So their niche will affect whether or not habitat and range can be shared. Would anyone like to ask any questions about that? <laughs> 